Great news. Our next guest is going to give you your life back because after listening to him, if you're wise, you will never obsess over polls again and you will never be trying to fall asleep in fear of a giant red wave that isn't coming. Simon Rosenberg writes, Red Wave became a collective delusion. It obscured what had been happening in the election since Dobbs. Elevated Democratic intensity, Republicans struggling, late promising Democratic data, good polls, strong early vote was dismissed. Hopium, it was called. Once again, the pundit world showed that Oscar winning screenwriter William Goldman's line about show business applies to them. William Goldman said of show business, quote, nobody knows anything. The politicos with whom I spoke today all agree as of now, a modest red wave, at the very least, seems to be building. The short answer is it's going to look good for Republicans. The longer answer is it's going to look very good for them. I, for one, never obsessed over polls during the campaign. I never reported on the generic congressional ballot polling because I think those polls are mostly useless and because, among many other things, as legendary House Speaker Tip O'Neill famously put it, all politics is local. So I personally gave up trying to figure out what was going to happen in congressional elections a very long time ago. But this year, whenever the latest poll showing some version of so-called bad news for Democrats came out, I always noticed that on Twitter, Simon Rosenberg had a wise counterpoint or two or more to raise about those negative polls for Democrats. Simon Rosenberg is now widely credited as the person who wisely saw through the red wave delusion when just about everyone else in the prediction game fell for it. Joining us now for a well-deserved victory lap <laughs> is Simon Rosenberg, a veteran yeah. of Bill Clinton's successful first presidential campaign, and he has served tours of duty at the Democratic National Committee, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. Thank you very much for joining us, Simon. Uh, I, I want to cover as much ground as I can yeah. for people just to yeah. convince them to stop obsessing over polls. <laughs> and, 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 and let me just begin with one thing that I've, I've heard you explain uh, brilliantly, and that is, what is a likely voter? What is a likely voter in polls and how that's basically some form of a guess? of who a likely voter is. Yeah, I mean, it is a guess, and it is it particularly it was particularly hard in this election because in the last two elections, the electorate grew so much. And we had all these new voters in the electorate. It was going to be very, very hard to know who was really going to vote. And so I do think this question about likely voter is gotten... It was always hard, but it was much harder in this election. It's one of the reasons why the polls were really all over the place over the last few months. And I want to go to something you said about what we saw in Michigan, which we were just discussing, this win yeah. uh, of both chambers of the state legislature yeah. and the governor. You've said that as the dust clears, that might be the most important thing that happened. Yeah, I think it's the most important thing. It may be the most important story of the election because it shows the power and potency of the abortion issue. It should really worry the Republicans. And on an issue that is just so important to so many people, they are so deeply out of position. And, and it's very hard to understand how they get back into position on this issue. Their base is not going to let them cut a deal with Democrats, not let them moderate in any way on this issue. They've made an historic error. And to me, it could be an error as big as what happened with the Republicans in the Great Depression, where an entire generation of people just look at that party as something that's just not really available to them. So I think it's a deeply consequential thing. It's not just going to drive this election. It could drive the next few elections. And it's why I'm very optimistic about Democratic chances in the coming years. You know, when you were in the Clinton war room and I was yeah. hanging around uh, my very first presidential campaign that I was working in the Senate, but we, uh, yeah. adjacent to it, I remember uh, being in New Hampshire and for the primary for the first time in my life. <laughs> and every you walk into one of the places where all the press is hanging out and the, everyone asked everyone else the same question. What do you know? It's just they don't know hello, nothing. Just what do you know? And, and, and to be smart in that conversation, you were supposed to know what was going to happen, which has something to do with what we were just seeing on video there with people pretending they know what's going to happen. Yeah, listen, the big miss this cycle was on Democratic intensity. I mean, the polls weren't wrong. The analysis was wrong. The analysis of the polls and the data were wrong. And let me explain really quickly why, right? In, in June, the election changed. A combination of Uvalde, January 6th committee hearings, 
you know, ending of Roe, the abortion restrictions. And all of a sudden, what we were seeing, right, in these five House specials that took place were consistent Democratic overperformance and Republicans struggling. You saw it again in Kansas. You saw Democrats overperforming, Republicans struggling. Didn't really look like a red wave. And then you saw Democrats raising much more money into their campaigns than Republicans. Another sign of Republican struggle. And then the voter reg numbers went way up for us, right? We saw a big surge of Democrats registering, particularly women and young women. So we were checking all of these intensity boxes and the Republicans were checking none of them. And so the question was, would that same dynamic show up in election day? And then the early vote came and we saw that same dynamic play out over the two weeks of the early vote. And so what we posited was, you know, look, what we're looking at here, and as you put out in the tweet earlier, the polling in the last few weeks also, if you stripped out the partisan polls, were pretty good for Democrats, including your final NBC poll, which may be the single best poll of the whole cycle, by the way, the NBC poll that came out the Sunday before the election. What we were looking at was high Democratic intensity for months and months and months, Democratic overperformance, a close competitive election, and polls that were on balance actually pretty good for us at the end. And so, you know, we were optimistic that on election day, the election that you saw was going to take place, and we're pleased that it did, obviously. Well, the breaking news of the night is another big win for the Democrats in Arizona with Democrat Katie Hobbs winning the governor's election. That means Donald Trump's Republican candidate for governor of Arizona, who is an election liar, let's use the right term, election denier is not quite specific enough, election liar, about the last presidential election, will not be in a position to destroy democracy in our next presidential election by trying to find a way to award Arizona's 11 electoral votes to Donald Trump or whoever the Republican presidential nominee turns out to be. That was, this was one of those races where, as President Biden put it, democracy was on the ballot. And this time, in the person of Katie Hobbs, democracy won. Some Democrats in Arizona and elsewhere who mistakenly believed polls indicating that Katie Hobbs was on her way to losing to Donald Trump's candidate, Carrie Lake, openly criticized Katie Hobbs for being what they considered a weak candidate, and they criticized her for her decision to refuse to debate Carrie Lake because Carrie Lake is a relentless public liar. That's why she refused to debate her. Katie Hobbs explained her decision not to debate this way. Unfortunately, debating a conspiracy theorist like Carrie Lake, whose entire campaign platform is to cause enormous chaos and make Arizona the subject of national ridicule, would only lead to constant interruptions, pointless distractions, and childish name-calling. Arizonans deserve so much better than Carrie Lake. And that is what Arizonans chose so much better than Carrie Lake. Here's what Katie Hobbs had to say about her opponent in what turned out to be Katie Hobbs' last appearance on this program before the election. She's not focused on what Arizonans need. She's focused on what the former president wants, which is exactly, is exactly why uh, he's endorsed her in this race and uh, why we have to stop her, because she has made it clear she's not interested in upholding the will of the voters if she doesn't agree with the will of the voters. And tonight, Katie Hobbs did stop her. Friday night, when Steve Kornacki and I delivered the news from Arizona that Democrat Mark Kelly won his reelection to a six-year term in the United States Senate, the Democrats moved to within one seat of control of the United States Senate. And then about 24 hours later in Nevada, Steve Kornacki was at the big board in the moment when the NBC News decision desk projected Democratic Senator Catherine Cortez Masto would be reelected to a six-year term in Nevada. That was the most important election announcement of the week since it ended the crushing suspense about which party was going to control the United States Senate. After the Nevada race was called, White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain, who will join us tonight, tweeted, Senator Schumer and Senator Gary Peters. That's the tweet. You will hear 
from both of them tonight. You've already heard from Senator Schumer during Rachel's hour, and you will hear from Senator Peters during this hour. When Mark Kelly won his Senate reelection in Arizona on Friday night, the first guest I wanted to hear from on this program was Senator Gary Peters, who is the chair of the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee. By Friday night, Gary Peters was already the most successful chair of the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee in a first midterm election of a Democratic president in the history of the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee. Now, he is even more successful by having delivered Democratic control of the Senate to the Democrats once again. That tweet by Ron Klain on Saturday night after the Democrats reached the magic number of 50 in the Senate was the White House Chief of Staff's highly experienced assessment of who gets credit for the Democrats holding the Senate. Senator Schumer and Senator Gary Peters, that's the tweet. When Chuck Schumer talked to get Gary Peters into becoming the chair of the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee, the COVID-19 pandemic was still raging through the United States. People were not yet vaccinated and travel was still very risky in a job where Senator Peters was going to have to travel to dozens of states in support of Democratic candidates running for Senate. In a private off the record chat with Senator Peters after he became the chair of the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee, I began by offering him my condolences for getting the worst job in the Senate. And that is the inside view in the Senate of running the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee, which is the single most difficult fundraising task any senator could ever take on. It is much more difficult than raising money for your own Senate reelection campaign. It is much more complex, much more unforgiving, much more relentless. It's the kind of job where you have to kiss your family goodbye for two years. And it is not easy to make friends while doing it because the most common attitude Senate candidates have is that the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee is not giving them enough money, no matter how much money they are getting from the DSCC. Gary Peters had the advantage of going into the job with no known enemies in the United States Senate and being known as a relentlessly hard worker who was never trying to elbow others out of the way for his own public attention. Gary Peters is now a hero, a hero on the majority side of the Senate. Unlike most chairs of the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee, Gary Peters' job is continuing on for four more weeks after Election Day to the next Election Day in Georgia on December 6th, when Gary Peters has the possibility of leaving a record of no Democratic senator losing a reelection campaign on his watch if Senator Raphael Warnock is elected in Georgia, reelected in Georgia on December 6th. The New York Times points out that that would be the first time no Senate incumbent has lost in either party since 1914. On the other side of this story, is the chair of the Republican Senate Campaign Committee, Florida Sen Senator Rick Scott, who has, has done the worst job of any chair of the Republican Senate Campaign Committee in the first midterm election of a Democratic president. Rick Scott contributed personally and mightily to the disaster the Republicans have faced when he said that Social Security should be repealed and that Social Security would then be replaced with a temporary five year program that could be reauthorized by Congress every five years if Congress passed a bill to do it. And if that bill was then signed by the president of the United States. In other words, Rick Scott proposed turning Social Security into retirement insecurity in the form of a program subject to the whims of Congress and presidents. Today, Senator Scott went to Georgia to help Donald Trump's chosen candidate, 
for Senate Herschel Walker and ended up saying exactly, exactly what Gary Peters would say about what's at stake in the Georgia Senate race that could deliver 51 Democratic senators to the United States Senate. We do the committees based on how many senators you have. So it's a 50-50 Senate. We have equal number of representatives, Republicans and Democrats, on these, each of these committees. Uh, so it, it make, it'll make a big difference in what type of legislation the people, you know, on top of that, it takes it takes 60 votes to get through um, a filibuster. Uh, so, you know, if we have 50, it's, if we're in a better position to stop something we think is crazy. Ron, uh, Jen Psaki said that that win would put a skip in your step. So thank you for skipping over to our yes. microphone this evening for this and discussion. Thank you for not, and thank you for not showing me skipping. I appreciate that. No, we're, we have that video for later. We're going we're to show that later. Uh, Ron, uh, what was that moment like uh, for all of you in the White House who were waiting for it? Well, I mean, obviously, it was enormously significant, historically this is something no president's done since John F. Kennedy to hold uh, Senate seats and potentially even go up one Senate seat pending the outcome in Georgia to keep control of the Senate, which will indeed allow the president to uh, pass legislation in the Senate and, of course, get people confirmed. And in some ways, perhaps most for historical purposes, the ability to get our judicial nominees confirmed by a Democratic Senate. And so that is one of the most important legacies of any president and a very, very important legacy to this president. And so uh, winning the Senate, keeping control of the Senate is just, a, you know, an unbelievable moment. You mentioned the Kennedy presidency. That's that that midterm is 60 years ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we know that in the White House, the president, the vice president and the White House chief of staff all participate in both governing and political campaigning issues and strategizing and considerations. And that means that Ron Klain is the most successful Democratic White House chief of staff in a midterm, first midterm election since 1962. Uh, the job that you held then was then held by Kenneth O'Donnell, not related yeah. to me in any way, from Massachusetts. Uh, what does it feel like for you personally? Because a lot of people were watching the job you were doing uh, over the last two years and over the last year, questioning how you were handling that job. What, what, what does this victory mean for you? Uh, what it means is I work with an incredibly talented group of uh, people, uh, starting off with uh, General Mally Dillon, who was the deputy chief of staff and oversees our political operation, uh, the president's chief strategist, Mike Donilon, uh, his chief communications guru, Anita Dunn, uh, Steve Reschetti, our legislative team. You just go down the line, uh, Keisha Lance Bottoms, who came in to oversee our outreach uh, in advance of the camp, uh, this election year. So, I mean, I, I am lucky to work with an amazingly diverse team of people, an amazingly talented team of people, uh, an amazingly dedicated team of people, and uh, they certainly, uh, you know, just work night and day to help deliver this result. 